Now let's go into this in a little bit of um, <clears throat> further in a more in a more detail. Please take this down. If you haven't taken it down, please take it down. Um, what's on the board right here, because it's going to be very important for our study in assessing the documentation, the information that we have, both in the um, the the Hebrew in the Hebrew documentation as well as in the Ethiopic um, documentation as well. Now let's see if we can find our our pointer. Okay, here's our pointer right here. Now the first thing that we need to understand is that there are four ancient versions of what's known as the Torah or the Orit. The Orit. Firstly, we have what's called the Orite Ayhud, or the Orite Yehuda, which often is referred to as the Masoretic. It's often referred to as the Masoretic. Now, we could put a question mark there, and perhaps at this point we should put a question mark right here, because in our study, it has brought up a question about this, and so far, it is still under investigation. Is it really, is the Masoretic that the modern Jews use really the Orita Ayhud or Yehuda, or is the Masoretic that the modern Jews use really this fourth Torah known as the Orita Samarawiya or the Samaritan Torah? We feel that it's more, more, more than likely the Samaritan. It would be the Samaritan um, Torah which became known as the Masoretic. But many other scholars believe that the Orita Ayhud, or the Torah of the Jews, or the Torah of Yehuda, is the Masoretic. But we put this question mark here, and uh, hopefully we'll have more time to, um, you know, to suss that particular matter out. But now, secondly, we have the Orita Lewawiyan, which is known as the Torah of the priest, or the priestly Torah, and that's the Levitical. Let's get over here. That's the Levitical, the Levitical, the Levitical Torah right there, the Levitical, the Levite or the Levitical Torah, the priestly Torah, Lewawiyan, the Levites, or Rita Lewawiyan, the priestly Levitical Torah. Now, from our study and investigation, the oldest of the Ethiopic documents relate to the Orita, especially the priestly documents, the churchical documents, what's known today as the churchical um, documents, um, especially that which is contained in the Met of Gadus of His Imperial Majesty, relates heavily to the Levitical because the priesthood of Ethiopia is based on the Levites because of the Ark, what's called the Tabo Christianity, Tabo Christianity or Ark Christianity, the, the Judeo-Christian um, practices of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahedo Church, especially the ancient Ethiopic Church, is heavily related to this priestical Levitical tradition. Now, we have the Orita Likana, the Orita Likana, which often is called the LXX, or the 70 Bible, or the Septuagint. The Septuagint, which they say is one of the oldest. In fact, the Septuagint is much older than the so-called Jewish 7th century Masoretic, which bears a lot of resemblance to the last one, the Samaritan. This is why we put a question mark right here, because the Orite Ayhud or Yehuda more than likely would be the Beta Israel of Ethiopia, the Falasha. The Falasha scrolls and the Falasha scriptures have more in common with this first Torah, the Orite Yehuda, seeing that their form of uh, Judaism is so um, primitive. Prime means first, one, is so old, ancient, 
and in some cases referred to as being archaic compared to the latter day um, um, Polish and German and the, the Spanish and, and Portuguese, speaking about the Ashkenazi and the Sephardim. Anyway, we have, we have lastly but not least, the, Ori the Orite Samrawian, the Orite Samrawian here, which is the Samaritan Ori or the Samaritan Torah. So there are four ancient versions of the Torah. However, which Torah is which today? In other words, which Torah is the Masoretic Torah? Which Torah is the Masoretic? Some would say, remember, we put this question mark here because uh, I think Haile Haptu, in his preliminary studies of um, the Ethiopian language, he touched on this very important point and he gave this reference from the life and contendings of Awestos. The life and contendings of Awestos is an Ethiopic document that tells of how the 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 returning Israelites, the Israelites who allow the right of return to uh, uh, Jerusalem during the time of Isra and Nehemiah, how they sent to the king of Ethiopia, they sent to the king of Ethiopia requesting the ancient Hebrew and the ancient um, Beta Israel documents such as the Orit, such as the Metahith, the books of Solomon, the books of the prophets, the first and second kings, or the four books of kings, which are known today as first and second Samuel and first and second kings in the more ancient times the first and second Samuel, first and second Kings were all known as the Book of Kings. So instead of first and second Kings being known as first and second Kings, it was actually known as third and fourth Kings. And Samuel was known as first and second Kings. So the, these sort of tells that we find as we study the ancient documentation shows us that the Ethiopic scrolls and the Ethiopic documents, although they may have, because they're on parchment paper, they had to be often rewritten over time, because parchment, remember, today we have printing. Since Gutenberg's printing press, we have, we have the whole printing press, so, and the photocopies. One can get books printed and photocopied, but in the ancient times, each scroll had to be handwritten had to be handwritten. So the materials that these scrolls were written on were usually parchment, either made out of papyrus as in ancient Egypt, or made out of animal skins, out of certain animal skins. Now anyone who understands um, that these um, type of uh, barana or migalot or migala scrolls would not last too long but would wear out and would often have to be rewritten. But if you go to the the um, scholiast, like the scholastic people, the institutional um, academics and the rest of them, they would tell you that the most ancient Ethiopian documents that they have recovered, they date them at most to the 13th or 14th century of our common era now. So they say they're not that actually that old. Well, the reason why they don't find older scrolls is because many of the older scrolls, unless they're buried somewhere in a dry place like an Egypt or a desert, most of these old scrolls had to be rewritten because they would wear out. These scrolls would wear out being made on parchment paper, and then they were very difficult, or parchment, they were very difficult as well to acquire. So each scroll in ancient times each of these originally had to be handwritten. Each of these, uh, uh, excuse me, yeah, each of these had to be handwritten. So this, this is very important to understand when we're speaking about the Torah, the ancient versions of the Torah, so forth. So each one of them had to be handwritten. Each one of them had to be handwritten. So when one say that the oldest Ethiopian documents are not more than the uh, 12th, 13th, 14th century, 
we must understand that what they're saying is that the actual rewriting, the latest rewriting or the latest writing handwritten documents, handwritten documents that they have recovered that were written on um, parchment, animal parchment or parchment paper scrolls. Remember, Ethiopia is a little more tropical than Egypt. And many of these scrolls, being animal skins and, and others, this is why they had monasteries up in up on mountaintops like Deborah Damo and so forth and so on because of the, the, the cooler, relatively speaking, and drier air would also preserve many of these ancient manuscripts much longer. But when we look at the actual language contained, when we actually look at the, the, the perspective of, of the scripture, in other words, when we look at what's, what the contents, this is how we can tell that the Ethiopic um, scrolls are older than the Septuagint, the modern Septuagint, the LXX, or the Greek, the Koina Greek, which was trans is the first translation from the Hebrew into another language. So that according to the Biblia the, the Bibliolators and according to the Bible people, um, they tell us that the first translation of the Hebrew documents outside of Hebrew was made into the Koina Greek or the common Greek you understand? And they call this the LXX or the Septuagint. But it's interesting that the LXX, which is the Roman numbers, basically, you understand? It was called Septuagint because it meant 70, they say. There were 70, some say, or 72 translators. There's many stories about allegedly how the Septuagint, or what we call here the Orita Likana, was translated or was translated from the Hebrew into the Koine Greek. Actually, they're wrong. They're wrong that it was translated into the Koine or the Common Greek. Greek came after the Coptic. The Coptic is actually older than the Greek. You see, they tell us that Coptic actually comes from Greek, but the Greeks actually came to Egypt to, to, to learn civilization from the Egyptian priests, and originally many of them black priests, as well as from the Ethiopian priests. This is why we get the name of Ethiopia as Ethiopia. Another point that we'd like to prove, and probably not in this particular, in this particular lesson right here, but another point that we'd like to prove is the name of Ethiopia that we find. People say Ethiopia is a Greek word. And we say that Ethiopia, as we have it today, is a Greek pronunciation of an Ethiopic word. Because the Ethiopic word was not understood and known, the Greeks interpreted the name Ethiopia from Tobia, from Tobia. But the LXX is often believed to be the oldest, one of the older versions that they have. And oftentimes, even the Masoretic and the Jews would compare things that are not clear to them in the Masoretic by referring to the Septuagint. But the earliest forms of the Septuagint was actually the Queen of Sheba's Bible, the oldest versions of the Septuagint. And how we arrive at this is from the fact that LXX refers to 70, Septuagint refers to 70. If you listen and go into the etymology of the language, Saba, Seba, Sheba, Saba, Sheba, Sheba means seven and seventy, oath and covenant. And it would refer to the time that Solomon and the Queen of Sheba first met. So the oldest version was that was before the Greek form of it. In other words, the Greek form was derived from the Sabian form. So there's an older Sabian, Ethiopian Sabian form of the Septuagint, you understand, that with Solomon and the Queen of Sheba's son returning with the 12,000 Israelites as well as the 1,000 firstborn sons of each of the 12 tribes of Israel, including the tribe of Levi, 
This is why we get these two streams right here. So the two streams that the Ethiopic scripture directly is related to is the Orita Likanat, as well as the Orita Lewawian, the priestly Torah, or the Levitical Torah, and the Septuagint, you understand? The older Septuagint, which was the Shebian or the Sabian, because the word Sheba, Saba, means seven and seventy. In the Hebrew, it means an oath, a covenant. So we have 770 Septuagint LXX. A later version of the Septuagint was made from the older Sabian or Queen of Sheba, the older Ethiopian Hebrew Bible. A later form of it now was made as the, the Jews or the black Jews, you understand, were in different lands such as Greece, you understand, and it was the black Jews that were responsible for such of these um, endeavors of translation of the ancient scriptures. And we see the black Jews were qualifying them as black ethnic ethnically so one would not confuse them with the, the Polish or the... Um, German Jews or the Spanish or the Portuguese Jews. Now, that leaves us now that we can basically account and see the reference to the second and the third. This still leaves a question mark at the first, the so-called Masoretic. This also leaves a question mark at the forefront right here, the Samaritan. Now, if one recalls for a moment, there was the southern tribe of Judah, you understand where Jerusalem was located in the region of Judah. And then there was the northern ten tribes um, that later on became known as Samaria, the northern part of Israel. So when Israel was split after the time of Solomon and Sheba and after Solomon's um, um, other son, besides Minyalik, who was known as Rehoboam, after he divided the kingdom, the kingdom was divided between the south Yehuda or Judah, the Ihud, and the North, the Samaritans. Now, the Book of Kings explains to us how there were another set of people brought in from all over the different parts of the Babylonian world by the king of Babylon, and they were brought in to replace the Israelites who were sent into captivity in the Babylonian captivity. Now, to make this very clear, let us go to the scripture. Let us go to the scripture right here so this can be so this can be further and better and better understood. This really needs to be better understood. And we've touched on this before. And some might not have understood why it was important for us to touch on this. 2 Kings, in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 24, it speaks about the kings of Assyria repeoples the cities of Israel. And, it's, and this is the same chapter, chapter 17, which speaks about the reign of Hosea over Israel. It speaks about how Israel becomes tributary to Assyria. It speaks in verse 4 about Israel the ten tribes being carried away into Assyria. Then it speaks about the sins for which Israel was carried into captivity. Then we get to verse um, 20, 24. Verse 24, it speaks about the king of Assyria, how the king of Assyria repeoples the cities of Israel. Now, it's important for us to remember that when we speak about Israel, we're talking about the northern ten tribes. This means we're talking about the what later would become known as the Samaritans or the Samrawian, the Samaritan. You understand? So this is going to help us account for one of the four ancient versions of the Torah or the Orit right here because it tells us here that and the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kuta and from Ava and from Hamath and from Sepharvaim and placed them in the cities of Samaria. See, Samrawiyan, Samaria, instead in the place of or instead of the 
children of Israel, and they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. Verse 25, and so it was at the beginning, we're in 2 Kings, in case you want to follow along with this and take a note of this, this is 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 17, we're at verse 25 now, it says, And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not, they feared not Yahweh, Baruchu, therefore Yahweh sent lions among them which slew, which slew some of them. Wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he hath sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Come thither one of the priests whom ye brought from thence, and let them go and dwell there, and let them teach them the manner of the God of the land. Now this is significant in now being able to understand where did this, this, this version, this fourth ancient version of the Torah, where did this version come from? The Orita Samrawiya, or the Samaritan, the Samaritan Torah, the Samaritan Orit. Now it's explained to us that the king of Assyria how the king of Syria brought men from Babylon, from Kutha, from Ava, from Hamath, and from Sepharvaim, these five, from five different places, non-Israelites, non-ethnic Hebrews, you understand? Now this gives us the most, the most um, probable, the most likely um, evidence of other peoples becoming or converting in some sense or another to Judaism or becoming Israelitish even though they were not of the seed, the Zer, of Israel. In other words, they became like the Israel in religion. This is where we have the whole difference between the Judahites and the Samaritans where Jesus Christos would say in the New Testament he would say in the, in, in the book of John, let's go there for a moment, in John when talking to the Samaritan woman at the well, a very significant and extremely significant um, encounter and incident in chapter 4 of St. John, Jesus Christos is speaking on the indwelling spirit in verse 22. He says, ye worship, ye know not what, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews or salvation is of Yehuda." Salvation is of Yehuda. He's saying, y'all worship what you don't know. But we know what we worship. And this is going to bring us to another, another um, teaching on worship. Because some say the, the worship of Hala Falasi. You know, you've probably seen this video. There's a video out there. And we want to just take them back to the basics so they can, first of all, understand what they obviously don't understand because they worship what they know not. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews or of Judah, of Moab and Bethesda and Negeta Yehuda. So make a note of St. John chapter 4, verse 22, in connection with the Samarawian, the Samaritans, and the four ancient versions of the Torah. Now, when we return to 2 Kings chapter 17, we find in um, verse 27 that the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither, carry there, one of the priests whom ye brought from thence. In other words, carry back there to teach this other group of people. It's almost like um, what they call it, uh, is it gentrification? You know, when they talk about when they're changing up a community, when, they, when other people, you know, when they talk about like white folks, and, and Asians and other nations and other people, everybody's moving into Brooklyn now. Brooklyn one time, Bed-Stuy and a lot of other areas of Brooklyn for 20, 30, 40 or more years was strictly black, you understand? For more than maybe a half a century, it was mostly black, these neighborhoods, these, these brownstone neighborhoods with, with 
Biggie, two, you know, you hear about Biggie, Small, Brooklyn. Now, Brooklyn, everybody knows about Brooklyn all over the world. But these neighborhoods were mostly black neighborhoods, is what we're trying to say. Now you get to see that with the crack epidemic and the COINTELPRO and the, the stopping the rise of the black messiah and the messiahs and, and really destroying the black community through the crime, the violence, the introduction of drugs, the bad education, the projects, all of that. They're able now to take the population out one way or the other. Either they kill them, either these people become so they lose their mind through through drugs, crime, violence, or get disease, or basically become unproductive. So what happens is that the neighborhood falls into disrepair, and then they come in and they buy up these neighborhoods for a little or nothing on the dollar, and they buy up houses right now. Even my own earthly owns her own house and has own her own house, and she tells me sometimes how they you know, ones and ones, old fay or white folks will come through and say, how much for your house? I'll pay you, I'll give you a million or two million, you know, they're trying to basically buy up and acquire the property. We, we mentioned that to show how a native group of people can be taken out of an area. Other people come into this area as these men who were brought from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharvaim, but they didn't know the God of the land. Now, the king of Assyria tells them to carry one of the priests, speaking about one of the ethnic Hebrews or the ethnic Israelites, to say the one of the black Hebrews, the black Israelites, whom ye brought from thence, and let them go and dwell there, and let them teach them the manner of the God of the land. Then one of the priests, whom they carried away from Samaria. So one of the priests who they carried away from Samaria, right, came and dwelt in Bethel, or Bethel, Bethel, and taught them how they should fear the Lord. This is, this is the first example that we have of the ethnic Hebrews, the ethnic Israelites, the black Hebrews, the black Israelites teaching, and this is, this is, this is, this is all very, very important how they're teaching another group of people how to be Israelitish or how to be Hebrews or Jewish in a religious kind of a sense. Because it says, furthermore, how be it, every nation made gods of their own. But every nation, every, each one of these five nations that were brought in made gods of their own and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made. Because this is one of the reasons why the Samaritans, the, the northern ten tribes, went into captivity to begin with because they were unfaithful in the Kalakidan with Yahweh. They were worshiping false gods, strange gods, foreign gods, and that's how they end up in captivity like how we, the lost sheep, lost but now found based on Israel, how our ancestors end up in captivity, in slavery, in the Americas and the Caribbean for the very same reason, because we are the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But it says, how be it every nation made gods of their own and put them in the houses of the high places, which the Samaritans had made every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. And the men of Babylon now tells, explains which gods they worship. They made Sukkot Benot, and the men of Kut they made Nergal, and the men of Hamath made Ashima, and the Avites made Nipaz and Tartak, and the Sepharvites, they burnt their children in the fire to Adramalek and Anamalek, the gods of Sepharvaim. So each of these people had their own gods that they worshipped. But here's the key. Here's how you're going to see how the corruption of what we call the, the 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 Hebrew worship. This is why we have so many different kind of so-called Jews today, or so many different kind of Hebrews or Israelites today. It goes on to say, so they feared Yahweh and made to themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places. So it says they feared, they reverenced to say that they were religious. They became religious-minded towards. Yahweh, the God of the, the captive Israelites, the God of the land, but they made to themselves 
of the lowest of them, priests of the high places, which the sac which sacrificed for them in the house of the high places. They feared, and again, it says in verse 33, verse 33, at the 33rd degree of this chapter, it says, they feared Yahweh and served their own Elohim. They served their own God. So they were religious. It's like you have many so-called Jews who will say, yes, they're Jewish, but they also do certain practices that the scripture condemns religiously. You understand when you could connect the synagogue of Satan thing with that as well. But it says, and they feared Yahweh the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from, from thence. So this is how, this is this was interesting, this is how Part of the blame is not just on these other nations, but part of the blame is also on the religion of the Samarawiyan. The, religiously speaking, they did not know what they worshipped. You, you see, when Christ said in John 4 and 22, um, you know not what you worship for salvation of the Jews. You all know what you worship. We know what we worship for salvation of Yehuda. He's pointing to this version of the Torah, the Yehuda version of the Torah, which is often called, quote, the Masoretic, you understand, or the traditional version of the Torah. But it says, unto this day they do after the former manners. They fear not Yahweh, neither do they after, after their statutes or after their ordinances, or after the law and the commandments which Yahweh commanded the children of Yaakov, whom he named Israel. So they have a form of Judaism, but it's not according to what Yahweh had commanded the children of Jacob, of Yaakov, whom he named Israel. Verse 35 says, With whom Yahweh had made a covenant and charged them, saying, Ye shall not fear or reverence other gods, nor bow yourself to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. But Yahweh, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt with great power and a stretched out arm, him shall ye fear or reverence, and him shall ye worship, and to him shall ye do sacrifice. And the statutes and the ordinances and the law and the commandment which he wrote for you, ye shall observe to do forevermore. And ye shall not fear or reverence other gods or false gods. And the covenant, the Kalakidan, which I made with you, ye shall not forget. Neither shall ye fear other gods. But Yahweh your God, ye shall fear, and he shall deliver you out of the hand of your enemies. Howbeit, after all of that, they did not hearken. They did not hear. They did not obey. They did not hearken, but did after their former manners. So these nations feared the Lord and served their graven images, both their children and their children's children, as did their fathers. So do they to this day. Now, Second Kings chapter 17 is very important in that respect because it shows us the possible origins of the Samarawiyan or the so-called Samaritan Torah. So when we say there are four ancient versions of the Torah, it's very important because now we know that there is, there are the so-called, let's write this right here, there are the Ashkenazi, right, Jews, which are mainly the, the Ashkenazis are mainly the Polish and the German Jews, then you have the Sephardic, right, which are the Spanish Jews, right, and then you have, and I'm going to just say this kind of collectively, then you have the, um, let's say the African, for lack of a better, we could say Ethiopian, but we want to also touch on the other Africans too. Now you have the African or the black, we could say, Jews. So you have the Sephardic Jews, right? You have the Ashkenazi, you have the African, and 
really you have also the Ethio, the Ethiopian Jews as well. Now, 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 now the reason why we're stating this, now of course some would say, well, you have other Jews and other people around the world too. You know, in China there, there are some communities, in India there are also other communities. And, um, but this is what we were talking about in Second Kings. Hamas is, is referring to even India. You understand? Know Hamas, Hamathites. But we'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, what's interesting is that with the division of Judaism that you have today, it should be possible for us to trace. Notice the Orita Likanat is linked with the Ethiopians as well as the Orita Lewawian. Now, the Orita Yehuda or Ihud, you understand, know is clear, is more related to the, what, what Christ was saying about salvation being of the Jews, the Masoretic, because Masoretic also means, the Masorah means tradition, and Christ often told, spoke to them about certain traditions which they had made up, which are, are, have nothing to do with what Yahweh commanded, you understand, know but the Masoretic the Ihud, the, the, the Jews, will be the religious authorities during the time of Christ. Now, by that time, the Lewawian, the true priest of Levitical, had already been removed. You understand? And we have um, one of the possible locations that the remnant went to was Ethiopia. And we have that through Solomon, the Queen of Sheba. Now, Orit Likanat, Orita Likanat, is a Septuagint. Now, what is interesting is that in Ethiopia you have both the priest and you have the learned one, the Likanat. Now, the LXX, or the Septuagint, as we said, we have Shebas, we have LXX means, we have any room here? LXX means uh, 70, right? And Sheba means 70. And then you have Saba, Sheba, Saba, which means 70, and it means an oath or a covenant. It's very interesting, the link that we have. And of these, we can say in the present forms, this is often referred to as being one of the oldest, the LXX, the Septuagint which we say the original version of it was that which was given to Sheba. You understand? When Sheba, the queen of Sheba, converted to um, the true God, the worship of the true God, of course she had to be given certain scripture, and, and her mission was to prepare her nation to stretch forth Ethiopia, to stretch forth her hands to God. So Sheba at the beginning of that process because she sought wisdom. She sought wisdom. Now, the Samaritan version of it, it's very interesting because it's five nations. There's five nations that are mentioned here. There's five particular nations that are mentioned here. And they all mention in connection with the Samaritan. And when Christ said to Samaritan woman, ye worship what you know not. And we see here in chapter 17 of 2 Kings, that they were still worshiping their false gods like Sukkot Benot, their false gods like Nergal, their false gods like Ashima, their false gods like Nibhaz and Tartak, their false gods such as Adramalek and Anamalek. It's interesting right there. So the, the, some of the questions still some of the questions still remain. We know that a remnant escaped after 70 A.D., you understand, after 70 A.D., and would make it to Egypt, Elephantine, some went down to the desert, some would eventually make it to other Hebrew communities in Africa, particularly Ethiopia and further South Africa, which we can say that the true Yehuda or Orita Yehuda was preserved in Ethiopia. So what is interesting is that with the exception of this last one right here, these three, you understand, the Samarawiyan would more than likely be 
the Masoretic. The, the modern Masoretic that we have today would most likely be related to the Samarawian or the Samaritan. And the Orita Yehuda or the Ehud, the Orita Ehud, would relate to the Ethiopian, to the, the true version, would relate to the Ethiopian Jews. You understand? And the Samaritan Masora. The Samaritan Masora is actually this modern Chumash or Jewish Bible. And there's a lot of other reasons um, as we study the content that, that help us to kind of know that. But this is an interesting discussion. First of all, what is fact is that there are four ancient versions of Torah, of the Orit. Now, exactly which ones are which, and, and how do we distinguish the, the scriptures that we have today, that's a process of um, study and investigation that is still ongoing. But take this down, make a note of this, and hopefully we'll touch on more, more to come, y'all willing. So, salamta, kena, yistalim.